Good morning! It's happy Tuesday to everybody. It is such a beautiful day to be here at Interpride, and I am joined by some wonderful, amazing, incredible, and talented researchers from the f and Global Barometer. So I'm going to go ahead and do a quick round of introductions. My name is Ryan Starzik, and I'm one of the global project managers here at Interpride, and I am joined by Susan Aaron and Aaron. So Susan, go ahead and take it away for us. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome. Good morning. Good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm Susan Dickwich Nelson. I'm uh, the uh, lead investigator, principal investigator on the FNM Global Barometers and a professor here at Franklin and Marshall. We're thrilled to talk to you about giving voice to LGBTQ plus advocacy legislation versus lived reality. And I'll have Aaron Maxwell and Aaron Hellenbeck uh, introduce themselves as well. Thanks, Susan. Um, my name is Erin Hollenbeck. I am the project manager for the FNM Global Barometers and also a research assistant from the project and a proud alum of Franklin Marshall College. <laughs> my name is also Erin Maxwell. Um, <laughs> I am also an alum of FNM College and I am a senior research assistant. Excellent. And so research is so important. And that's, uh, you know, that's one of the ways that Susan and I were able to connect at the ILGA conference is that we had a shared love of data. I know not everybody has that, but our shared love of data is really what helped us come together and eventually build this uh, very important partnership because research is important. It helps us advance the global pride movement and it helps us understand what's going on in different countries. So Susan, I'm going to go ahead and just let you take off with uh, making the introduction on the FNM Global Barometer and how incredible it is and where it's going next. Okay, thanks, Ryan. And and really, it's uh, amazing to be able to partner with Interpride. It was a wonderful opportunity to meet you in Long Beach. And I'm really looking forward to working with you um, and other organizations in the future to make sure that we get the LGBTQ plus voice out there and that we're able to have um, excellent data to uh, advance uh, LGBTQ plus human rights. So let's talk about um, what we're going to talk about today. And let's see, can everybody see that advanced? There we go. Um, let's talk about our goals today. Um, we are going to take you through some data and hopefully not make it too boring <laughs> because we know that data can be a little overwhelming and a little boring sometimes, but we're going to make it interesting. So I'm going to walk you through um, the FNM Global Barometers projects and our results. We'll explore the state of global LGBTQ plus activism, looking particularly at um, some case studies. We'll analyze correlations and disparities. So we're looking at things that um, we can see that um, are related and things that um, are not related between legislative and lived reality. And then we're also going to examine the connection between visibility, which is so important, uh, organizing and rights protection. So let's talk about uh, what we do here at the FNM Global Barometers. We're really going to only focus on three of our projects today. So we're going to focus on the Global Barometer of Gay Rights, which we call the GBGR. And we're going to focus on the Global Barometer of Transgender Rights, which is the GBTR. And then we'll focus on the Global Barometers LGBTQI uh, plus Perception Index, which is the GBPI. We love our acronyms at the FNM Global Barometers. It's something that political scientists like to do. Um, so basically what the GBGR uh, focuses on is 27 items, and we measure the extent to which countries are human rights protecting or persecuting of um, sexual orientation. And the GBTR looks at 17 items, same thing in terms of five dimensions, and we measure the extent to which countries are human rights protecting or persecuting towards uh, gender identity. And our most exciting um, newest product, as I mentioned, is the GBPI, which looks at the perception index. And this is where you all came in, uh, because last summer we actually launched the GBPI. And it was a survey based, uh, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in depth. It was survey based and we really wanted to hear your voice to get a sense of how safe you felt, um, whether you experienced violence in the past and what was the, the, what was your lived reality in terms of human rights as an LGBTQI plus identifying individual. Um, so let's get into how we actually do our methodology and I'll, try to make this as painless as possible. Um, but what is our methodology behind the GBGR and GBTR? So what we look at are five dimensions, as you can see. So we have the de jure protection, 
uh, which really looks at the laws that exist. And then we have de facto. So what is actually happening uh, in terms of, for example, is there arbitrary arrest or other things uh, based on sexual orientation or gender identity? Um, LGBT rights advocacy, which is what we're going to focus on specifically with this presentation. Socioeconomic rights, um, items like, for example, whether there are non-discrimination uh, for workplace or fair housing and societal persecution. So is there violence um, towards individuals based on their sexual orientation or gender identity? Uh, we use a unfortunately a binary um, when we uh, look at our data. So we have a one or zero, so one positive, zero negative. And as you can see, we rank countries on a scale of A to F. So A is uh, protecting and F is considered uh, persecuting. So you can see 100% is A is the best score you can get and zero at F is the lowest score that you could get. Whoops, we don't want to go backwards, we want to go forwards. Um, sorry for the lot, it's a, it's a lot to see, but this is basically our scorecard. So this is for the Global Barometer uh, of Gay Rights Scorecard. And you can see the highlighted area in yellow is what we're going to focus on today. And it's called the LGBT rights advocacy dimension. So we're going to look, for example, um, whether countries allow for uh, LGBT organizations to be legally registered, whether they actually exist, um, whether, they're, whether LGBT organizations are able to peacefully and safely assemble, uh, whether LGBT rights are allowed by the state, and whether security forces provide protection for LGBT pride participants. Um, obviously, we know in the past, um, you know, um, security forces haven't always been a positive when it comes to pride um, partic participation, um, but in many countries, having the protection of security forces to allow for pride to happen is very important. You can see the second uh, scorecard is the GBTR, and you can see the breakdown based on the dimensions and the various items. So we're not going to spend too much time on it because it um, can be a bit overwhelming and we don't have that much time. But let's get to some of the results. And so these are our latest results, the 2020 results for the GBGR and the GBTR. As you can see, it's color coded and the GBGR results are on the left and the GBTR results are on the right. Um, just some quick highlights. You can see there's a difference between how countries protect uh, LGB individuals and how they protect trans individuals. One of the most striking examples, for example, is the United States. It's C uh, resistant under the GBGR. Under the GBTR, it's an F. You know, it's, a, it's a pink, so it's not a dark red um, uh, towards a zero or eight, but it's still considered an F, um, which means it fails and how it treats its um, transgender individuals. If you live in the United States, that's not surprising, but it's important to have this data uh, to be able to actually uh, quantify and show what the uh, situation is. Um, the most protecting region is Western Europe, uh, both for the GBGR and GBTR, as you can see. Um, unfortunately, the most uh, persecuting regions are the MENA regions, uh, Middle East, North Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so let's get into a bit more specifics. I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues now to look um, at uh, how LGBT organizations are allowed to, to register. Thanks, Susan. Um, so this is probably the part that you're most interested in if you're part of an activist organization. Um, and as Susan mentioned, we track five indicators related to LGBT advocacy, but today we're going to just talk about three specific ones. Um, so on our map, this is the, these are the places where LGBT organizations are allowed to register. So those are the countries in green that can register there. And the ones in red are where LGBT organizations cannot register. And when we look at registration, we look at places where organize, we look at items where organizations can actually promote LGBTQ issues. So they can't necessarily be also promoting other issues including public health. It has to be specifically an LGBT organization. Um, and so sometimes LGBT organizations are prevented from being allowed to register for issues such as uh, propaganda or censorship laws. Uh, for example, in Afghanistan, LGBT organizations are not allowed to register because it would go against the quote unquote national interest. As you can see from the start of our database at 2011, at least half of the countries we track do allow registration. And that number has increased just a bit in the past 10 years. So in 2020, 130 countries now allow LGBT organizations the right to register. 
and if Susan, you want to hit next, then you can see some of the more specific um, events that are happening around the world. As I mentioned, Afghanistan, for example, organizations are prevented from registering due to something about the national interests of the country. And then if we take a look at Pride events allowed by the state. So here we look at if organizations um, are allowed to host Pride events and if the public or the government actively campaigns to stop them through legal or violent means. You'll notice that the number of countries that have Pride events is slightly lower in 2011 than the number of countries that were that give Oops. the right to register. That's okay. But uh, this number has increased positively in the past 10 years. Um, and even in some cases, such as in France, um, the government is actually actively a part of planning Pride events, hosting them, monitoring them. But in other cases, such as in the Philippines, uh, the government is a part of active suppression of Pride events through the use of security forces. Again, this usually occurs under the guise of morality or nat national interest. There are some exceptions you'll notice. So you, you'll see some little holes of green throughout Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so for example, South Africa, Angola, Mongolia, Namibia, Thailand, Vietnam, all of these places do have the right uh, to, for people to have pride events, uh, despite the fact that the rest of the countries that are neighboring them usually do not. And then finally, we'll look at one more specific item. Again, the green are the places where people have the right to peacefully and safely assemble, and the red are the areas that do not have that right. When we track peacefully and safely assembling, what we do is we don't look at whether or not events occurred, but we look specifically at whether these groups were allowed to peacefully and safely assemble without um, public interest groups rallying against them, starting campaigns against them, or again, if the government intervenes through legal or violent means. And this item also tracks not only assembling in the political sense, but also in the more communal sense, so bars and clubs where LGBTQ people might assemble. Again, this number has increased from 2011 to to 2022. In 2011, it was 97. And then in 2020, it was 117. This item actually tends to fluctuate quite a bit, though. Um, in fact, in 2019, there are actually 121 countries where people had the right to safely assemble. So as you'll see, that number actually decreased a little bit in 2020. And as the political, cultural, and economic context change in a country, so too does acceptance of LGBTQ people. In Paraguay, for example, pro-family pro groups um, attacked pride participants with flash grenades and stones. So that's the legislative reality, and that's data from our 204 countries from the global FNM Global Barometer of Gay Rights and the FNM Global Barometer of Transgender Rights. And while I'm sure we all know that legislation certainly impacts our ability to live a free and full life, we know that legislation also cannot capture what is actually happening on the ground in some instances. So given this and the general dearth of data on LGBTQ lives, the FNM Global Barometers team came up with the LGBTQI Perception Index, or the GBPI, as we call it. Hopefully some of you actually saw it and took it, um, and we, you know what we're talking about. Um, but the GBPI is a survey that asks respondents to evaluate their lived realities in the country they have lived in for the past 12 months. This is a first-of-its-kind survey, which may seem surprising, but the... Um, amount of data out there on LGBT lives is usually actually about how straight people or the general public feel about LGBTQ people or what their stance is on LGBTQI issues. This is the first survey that really asks the global community, the global LGBT community, like, how do you feel about the place that you live in? How accepted do you feel? How safe do you feel being in your community? And this is the methodology of the GBPI. Um, we launched the GBPI in June of 2022, and it ran through that September of 2022. We launched it with the help of organizations like Interpride, which was, again, incredibly helpful in getting this survey into the right hands. We also, um, we also collaborated with dating apps such as Grindr, Her, and Eden. And then we also collaborated with our partners at academic institutions and other LGBTQI plus NGOs. The survey was available in four languages, such as Arabic, French, English, and Spanish. And what happened is uh, respondents answered six simple questions that had to do with safety, acceptance, 
fear of police, violence, safety and gathering, and discrimination. They responded to these questions on a Likert scale, where one was the lowest or most negative response and five was the highest or most positive response. And then we use the same report card style grading as the barometers to grade e each country. We took the aggregate and then gave it a grade from zero to 100%. 100 is the most positive, and A would be the most positive, and F the least positive or the most negative. Um, we had over 167,000 responses, which is a really exciting number for a pilot survey, but we hope to launch the survey again in the summer of 2024 and target areas where we did not have a robust sample size. This is perhaps a great place for us to collaborate with activists, and if anyone is interested um, after the talk or during the Q&A, we'd love to further discuss how we can partner with activists and ensure that the survey gets into the right hands. Well, here are the overall results of the GBPI. A um, couple of things you might notice right away. First of all, there's, there's some gray on the map, and that is because um, we omitted countries that had less than 30 responses. And again, these are places where we would, we would particularly like to collaborate with activists. Um, you'll also notice that there's no blue on this map. There is no country that scored an A on the GBPI, and there are only eight countries that scored a B. And also, since 50% of these countries scored an F, we can kind of safely say the global lived reality is not positive. It is negative for LGBTQI plus people. Um, these results mirror the barometers on the whole. Um, Western Europe generally accounts for the highest scoring countries. Um, there are some exceptions in the Asia Pacific. Uh, for example, Thailand, Taiwan, and New Zealand are some of the highest scoring countries. And Czechia in Central Europe is also one of the highest scoring countries. And then again, the negative uh, lived the most the places with the most negative lived reality are in Sub-Saharan Africa and the MENA region. And finally, we take a look at the highest and highest and lowest scores on the GBPI. Again, this is a bit similar to the barometers, though. So as you'll notice, the scores are still lower, right? The highest score is Iceland at 86, which is a B, not an A. Um, and of course, most of Western Europe, some of Western Europe, I should say, takes up the highest scoring spots, Denmark, Finland, another Nordic country, Norway. All of these are some of our highest scores, but again, we have some exceptions with Taiwan, Thailand, and New Zealand in the Asia Pacific region. And then again, right on the bottom, we have countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and MENA. You'll notice that the United States is not on this list. The United States scored a C, so neither positive or negative, which does mirror uh, its global barometer of gay rights score. Um, in, in 2020, the United States scored a 74 on the GBGR. And now I'll, I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Aaron Maxwell, who's going to tell you a little bit more about the data by question. Thanks, Aaron. Still feels weird. Um, <laughs> so first, we're going to take a deeper look of one of the six questions that's relevant to advocacy. Um, we chose Q4, which is fear of violence. So the question reads, during the past 12 months, on a scale of one to five, where one means very likely and five means not at all likely, how likely are you to be a victim of violence due to your sexual orientation, gender identity, or intersex status? So if we take a look at how Q4 does on the regional level, there is a clear variance between Western Europe and the other regions. This graphic shows us that the average Q4 GBPI score um, so it's just disaggregated by region. You can see Americas, Asia Pacific, Central Eastern Europe, Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Western Europe. So we can see that the MENA region has the lowest average score at 47%, and that Western Europe has the highest average score of 71%, which is more than 10 percentage points higher than the global average, which is 59%. Um, so these are the highest and lowest scoring countries on Q4 specifically, um, which may be different than the highest and lowest scoring countries overall. Um, so Finland was the top scorer, meaning that respondents felt the least likely to be a victim of violence in Finland. Syria and Egypt were the lowest scorers, meaning that respondents felt the most likely to be a victim of violence. So... Next, we're going to take a look at Q5, we're just introducing them for now, um, which is safety and gathering. Um, so the question read, 
on a scale of one to five, where one means not at all safe and five means very safe, how safe do you feel gathering with other LGBTI people in public? So for Q5, um, Western Europe still scores the highest at 77, um, with the Americas over 10 points behind at 64%. However, on Q5, Sub-Saharan Africa actually scores the lowest with 46%. And the global average is higher on Q5 than Q4, so um, uh, fear of violence scores lower overall than safety and gathering, but it's only by a percentage point. So these are the highest and lowest scoring countries on Q5, safety and gathering. So the highest score was Taiwan at 88% which is significant as most of the other top scores are European. Finland, Iceland, Denmark are close behind. And the lowest score was Mali at 30%, meaning that respondents in Mali felt the least safe in gathering. Ghana, Guinea, and Togo followed close behind, as do the Maldives, Nigeria, Tanzania, and Uganda. So this graphic actually shows us something really empowering. So in countries where LGBT organizations are able to peacefully assemble, respondents, on average, feel less likely to be a victim of violence, as shown by the first column, and more safe in gathering, as shown by the second column. These numbers show the average score of countries where countries are able to peacefully assemble as compared to the average score of countries where countries are not able to peacefully assemble. This is empowering because it suggests that governmental protection and or legislation that advocacy pushes for is effective to improve the lived human rights reality of the LGBTI plus community. Oops. <laughs> so similarly, we can see that government permission for pride events also correlates with lived human rights reality of the community on the ground. So where LGBT pride events are allowed by the state respondents felt like they were less likely to be a victim of violence and more likely to be safe in their gathering. It also should be noted that the variance between the two scores is very high as the averages are near or over 20% higher in countries where LGBT pride events are allowed by the state. Hmm. <clears throat> so here's the first case study that we're gonna be looking at today. Um, we chose Ghana, obviously, because of the somewhat recent news that a broad anti-LGBTQ plus bill will be passing, you know, maybe, <laughs> we'll see, um, banning any sort of association with or display of support for the community. We also chose it, however, because it surprisingly does allow for the right to register, as proven by the registration of Solus Initiative in 2013. So although Ghana's overall GBGR score and GBTR score are both Fs, um, the appearance of this positive advocacy item in the legislative world is interesting and may also be misleading. For example, if a researcher was looking to measure the allowance for advocacy across the world and chose the right to register as their single variable, they might think Ghana is doing pretty well. Without the context of no peaceful assembly and no sanctions for pride events, the appearance of LGBT NGOs makes it seem as though advocacy in some way is supported. This is where the GBPI comes into play and why it's so important. Even though registration is possible, Ghana scores a very low F on Q4, fear of violence, and Q5, safe in gathering. This shows us what's actually happening on the ground, regardless of this one positive indicator. So obviously, open source research, especially newspapers, can help us gauge by proxy what's occurring at the ground level. This is supplemented by our indicator-based research that gives us a better quantifiable and holistic picture. For example, we also know that homosexuality is criminalized in Ghana. There are no hate crimes laws, no anti-discrimination laws, and no free and fair trial for LGBTQI persons. But the GBPI lets us actually hear from the voices of the community in a given country. For instance, we can hear the fear from the people living this reality. So this person who is gay between the ages of 25 and 35 and lives in a city says, Ghana is on the verge of passing a law that takes away people's fundamental human rights on the basis of sexual orientation and freedom of choice. This law when passed will put all LGBTQI persons in grave danger and most likely threaten our very existence. And we also receive calls to action. 
Um, so this man who is gay between 25 and 35 and also lives in a city says we need international support for the LGBTQI plus community in Ghana. So now let's look at a country that's doing a little bit better legislatively and in its lived reality for the community. So although Thailand only scores a C overall in the GBGR, freedom of assembly is constitutionally protected, peaceful assembly is recognized, and gatherings are granted permission. Although it does better than the regional average in Asia, a C still isn't great, and is surprising when compared to the GBPI scores. If you'll remember, Thailand was actually one of the highest scoring countries overall, and shockingly scores a B on Q4, fear of violence, and on Q5, safety and gathering. So Thailand has, pride, has had pride events. Um, if you go to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> they have had pride events with no or few incidents reported, and they do have supportive security forces, workplace anti-discrimination laws, and no criminalization of homosexuality. However, as indicated by their C overall, they still have work to do, including the ratification of marriage equality. The comments from the country seem to reflect the higher perception of lived reality, the legislative reality. So this person who is also gay between ages of 25 and 35 um, and lives in the city says, living in a country where being LGBTQIA plus is considered normal, sometimes people forget about the equal rights. We still need the law to support our rights as a citizen. So again, kind of a call to action to us. Um, so finally, we'll quickly look at Malaysia. So Malaysia has an F overall on both the GBGR and GBPI, but its GBP GBPI score, so its perception of lived reality, is higher than the legislative reality. In Malaysia, there's no right to register, and applications like the one for Palangi campaign are rejected. There's also no right to peaceful assembly, and the annual Gay Rights Festival was banned in 2011. So Malaysia has been actively enforcing its criminalization, which goes along with its lack of freedom for arbit arbitrary arrest and its lack of free and fair trials. And with the GBPI, we know that the community is there is aware of their lack of rights and wants this to change. So I'll leave you with this little call to action. So this person who's gay under 25 and is in the city says, I want Malaysia to legalize and give rights for the LGBTQ plus community. So I'll turn it back over to Susan now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Um, so uh, obviously we've gone through a lot very quickly. There's a lot of data and you probably can't remember half of it, but let's uh, talk about some of the um, key points that we'd like to make. Um, the first is, as we know, uh, protection of LGBTQI advocacy worldwide is under threat, um, and it's important that LGBTQI plus individuals are able to organize that do have the protection from the state and the recognition uh, of their organizations. Um, it's also important to know that there is a difference between lived and legislative realities in countries, and that can be really crucial to inform policy and action. So in some countries, they look better legislatively, they look better on paper than they actually are um, in reality. Um, in other cases, um, not as many, but it, with the case of Thailand, for example, we saw that the lived reality, the lived human rights reality for LGBTQ plus people was actually better than the legislative reality. Um, so having that data and having that information, especially as we talked about the dearth of uh, LGBTQ plus um, information being available and data being available, it's very important to collect that data and get the voice, to hear your voices um, from the ground. Um, unfortunately, um, if we look at the GBGR or GBTR or GBPI, we still see that the majority of countries in the world are still persecuting of sexual orientation and gender identity minorities. Um, again, it doesn't matter if it's the GBGR, um, the majority of countries scored an F or the GBTR, um, they all scored an F. And as we noted with the GBPI, no country actually scored an A. Uh, and the best country um, was an 86% with Iceland. We have to recognize, and it's important to recognize that progress is happening. Um, it can be depressingly slow um, and it is marginal. Some regions have been progressing much quicker um, and more widely um, than other regions. 
Um, and we do have to take into account some of the worrisome trends um, that are happening in countries uh, like Uganda, for example, um, and potentially Ghana. Um, hopefully Ghana will not go the same route as Uganda, but um, it, it doesn't look good at this point. Um, and overall, uh, visibility and organizing are very important. As you know, um, it's important for people to um, outside of the LGBTQ plus community to know that we're here. And as we say, we're queer <laughs> and we're not going to stop organizing and we're not going to stop uh, demanding our um, equal human rights. Um, so thank you all for the work that you're doing uh, on the ground. It's very important. Um, we're just crunching the data and collecting the data and making sure that the data gets to the right places and hearing from you on how we can better utilize this data, how we can better share this data will be really, really helpful to us. Um, so we'll just close with um, a thank you. And if there are any questions or comments, um, please scan our QR code. Um, we have some um, important information there, whether it's the um, uh, listserv, you can sign up uh, to our listserv to get um, relevant information, our annual report we should be releasing hopefully at the end of May. Um, and we'd love to hear from you and, and get some ideas on how um, you'd like to see this data used. Thank you. Brian? Yes, so thank you for that. And so we do have a comment from Richard Retherbell. We have debated for years whether or not queer people should visit nations that criminalize homosexuality or transgender individuals. Many gay men flock to Jamaica or other Caribbean nations. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I'm sorry, what was the first part again? We debated uh, whether they should visit nations. Right. Um, <laughs> well, I, I think that's a a personal choice, um, especially if you're part of the LGBTQ plus community, um, it's, it can be very dangerous. Um, as a researcher um, and a member of the LGBTQ plus community, uh, I certainly would not go to um, countries like Uganda or Ghana right now. Um, it's just too dangerous. Um, should we be giving our money to countries that are actively persecuting or at least not protecting their LGBTQ plus um, populations? Um, that's a tough question. Um, you know, some say that if we penalize countries, um, especially nation by nation, um, that it, it can be viewed as uh, imperialistic or Western imposition of Western values. Um, I think it's really important to note that um, recognizing the human rights and dignity of every human being is not a Western viewpoint alone, and it shouldn't be a Western viewpoint alone. Um, human rights are for all, and the West doesn't have a monopoly on the notion that everyone um, should be treated equally. So from that perspective, I think our governments that are protecting of LGBTQ plus people should pressure other governments that are not. And I think it should be readily available to individuals when they are thinking of traveling to countries like Jamaica or Uganda or Ghana, that these countries are actively persecuting their LGBTQ plus um, people. And do you want to support a government that does that? I don't know if my colleagues, Aaron or uh, Aaron, have another um perspective on that? I, I do think you summed it up, Susan. I would just add that, you know, some of these nations do rely on tourism from not just the LGBT, LGBT community, but the general community as well. So again, that goes back to, you know, do you want your dollars to support that country? And there's a bit of hypocrisy there. These governments know that people are going to come be tourists and they rely on people not really caring about the, the social and political context in that country. So again, think wisely about your dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point because there's so much persecution going on around the world right now that we you know, as, as the queer community, we really have to be more cognizant of the lived realities in these locations. Mm -hmm. And that's why the survey is so vital and important, because it could give us a perspective that we didn't have before it came out. And so mm -hmm. I encourage all my queer friends, activists, to, before you decide that where you're going to go and spend some of your hard-earned money, make sure it's not in a place that's working against our community. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think there are, are wonderful places that are very um, human rights protecting. Um, and perhaps another perspective is asking members of the queer community um, in those countries that are persecuting what their preference would be. Do they want people to come to their country um, and spend tourist dollars in their country? Um, do they want people to know what's happening on the ground or do they want the, do they want their government and their society to be shunned by um, the international community uh, because of their lack of protection? Sometimes exposure and seeing and visibility is really, really important, but do we actually have to go to that country and give that country the money um, at the same time is, is, is a, an interesting question. Just for the record, Definitely I'm never is. traveling to Jamaica <laughs> until they become more human rights protecting. It's a slow moving ship in Jamaica. There's there's some hope on the horizon, but there's still a lot of work to do. Now, what do you encourage activists and pride organizers? How can they use this data for their you know day to day operations? Or what will be some of the ways that you think that they could benefit from obviously leveraging this information for their own local advocacy work? Sure, that's a great question. Um, pressuring their governments, um, you know, publishing reports, um, letting people know what the situation is on the ground, um, you know, verifying whether our data is correct legislatively and um, lived reality. Uh, in other words, putting some um, some real um, life examples to that, I think is the human part of that. Like, what does it mean? I mean, we can crunch data and say, uh, pride events are not allowed or the state doesn't provide security forces. But what does that really look like on the ground? Um, making it real, I think, is really helpful. The human part of that story um, really brings to life what the reality is and why people should care and why people should fight um, within the LGBTQ plus community, outside of the LGBT uh, plus community for uh, human rights for all. So being able to, you know, when a government says, oh, we're not that bad, like you're just exaggerating to be able to show the data and say, well, actually, here's your score. And here you are relative to other countries. And if you want to be considered with this group of countries, you need to step up your game. Yeah, I would just That's add really to that, point. Um, that our data really allows activists and policymakers to direct their efforts. Um, by looking at our data points, we know what's missing in these countries. And sometimes, especially on our human rights report cards, there's items that are, you know, really far ahead in the future for a lot of these countries. So gender affirming prison accommodations, things like that, that a lot of governments might not even be considering or thinking about. So that really allows activists like you um, to direct their efforts um, and kind of specialize in these different places that you know, might not be on policymakers' minds. Um, and with the GBPI, we can actually take the temperature of the actual population and kind of see for them what is the most important priority. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Well, it doesn't look like we have any other questions, uh, but is there any other discussions that we want to have around this? I think that uh, research is vital. We have to keep doing it. I'm excited to work with all of you at the university to keep this going. I know that when the next survey comes out, we are going to push it very heavily to make sure we can get 250,000. That's the goal, 250,000 <laughs> responses on the next one. Quarter million, uh -uh, Ryan, we can do it. No, we no, have to do it together. No. No, no, the goal is a million. <laughs> a million. Okay, let's the, go with a million. a million. Okay, that's the new goal. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, this is an opportunity for the LGBTQ plus community to share their voice and to share their reality. And I really can't emphasize more strongly the importance of this survey. Again, we were stunned to get 167,000 um, responses. Um, and then I thought, well, maybe we can get 500,000, but I think that was a bit um, <laughs> ambitious the first round. But now we have until the summer of 2024 to get this out. So we really need your voice, not only to spread the word about this survey, um, but to also get people to take it. And we made it deliberately short so that people, um, because we know as activists, everyone is asking of your time 
and everyone wants you to do something. And it's just, there's so much to do, but this survey is so very important. Um, again, it's the first of its kind in that is it, it's global reach and it's so inclusive of the entire LGBTQ plus community. Um, we really, really need to hear your voice and we're willing to partner with any and all in getting this out um, as far as possible. And we really, really, I just wanna underscore again, really, really um, value the relationship that we have with Interpride. They've been an incredible partner and we're really, really looking forward to working with them in the future. Oh, well, at that note, I mean, that's that's leaving us in the best possible position right now. Thank you. And all of you have been wonderful to work with. This has taught me so much being able to dig into the data to make some really strategic decisions about some of the messaging, how to do the messaging, where it should go. And what kinds of, uh, you know, advocacy articles we should be putting out. This data has helped me be able to do that because there are yeah. things that maybe we th take for granted uh, in Western civilization. We take certain things for granted. Other areas are not going through uh, the same. I mean, yeah, we're digressing a little bit, but, it, you know, overall, we're not at nearly the kind of fear of being um, persecuted as some people in like Uganda or Ghana. Mm -hmm or in parts of Asia. So it, it just comes down to this is so important for us to really get a picture. And it gives us a visual picture. And it only takes a few seconds. You could just go on, you could take the survey, it only takes a few minutes, and that's it. So when it comes out, please share it. Please, please share it. Help us get that good data. <laughs> And, and I would just add, please, um, please reach out to us if you have any questions or if you want our data. Um, we are happy to share our data with you. Um, we also want to hear what's important. Um, are we missing something? Um, should we be tracking something? Um, again, recognizing that we're looking at 204 countries and territories. So um, even though there are a lot of things that we'd like to track on the GBGR and GBTR, we can't track everything. But if there's something that we're missing that you think that we should be focusing on, or if there's a report that we should be writing um, that would be helpful, either country level or region level or um, global, um, we really, really need to hear your voice. Um, we're part of the community. Um, but you are, you've got the feet on the ground and you know what the issues are on the ground and we need to hear from you. I just, I have to say that over and over again, um, please reach out to us. We'd love to partner with you and we want to make this data relevant. We don't want it to just be an ivory tower thing that sits on some shelf, um, buried away in some deep, dark library. We want this data to be useful. Please tell us how it can be useful to you. Excellent. Well, hey, I am excited to see the next iteration of this important survey and this important work continue. And of course, we are going to continue our important partnership to make sure that we can keep advancing the pride movement, the queer movement, and fighting for equality for everybody around the world, because that's exactly what we are here for, to keep that fight going. And this helps us do that. Amen, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm running for president. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you got my vote. You got my vote. <laughs> Love it. Well, I want to thank you all again for being here. And if um, you have any addition, any closing thoughts, we're going to go ahead and wrap everything up. But uh, this has been great. And I want to thank you again for being here and showing our audience and sharing this. And, you know, of course, we're going to continue this important relationship. Excellent. And thank you all for your questions. Um, and again, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, our email is gbgr uh, at fnm. What is it? Fnm.edu. <laughs> it's in the uh, chat. Sure. There you go. I never email myself. Yeah, just look at the chat. Um, please email us. We'd love to partner with you and learn more about um, some of the issues that you're facing. And we'd love to be able to focus in, maybe do a focus on your particular country or your organization. We're happy to do that as well. All right. Well, thank you again. Bye, everyone. Thank we'll you. talk to you.